Hello and welcome to your lesson on other resources that humans use that aren't necessarily our energy resources. Here's your joke for the day. So our first topic is forest resources. Uh, so from trees, we get things uh, like maple syrup, rubber, and nuts. These are things that we don't necessarily need to cut the tree down to receive. Um, but you can also cut down trees and get lumber and wood pulp. Uh, wood pulp can be used to make plywood or paper, among other things. Um, so coniferous trees like pines and spruce are used for lumber and wood pulp. They tend to be really fast growing and have a little bit weaker, um, softer wood. And then hardwoods like oak, cherry, maple, etc., are used for furniture or maybe flooring. Other benefits of trees, trees are a resource for us because they produce oxygen and absorb carbon dioxide and they even sometimes filter our air and make it cleaner by absorbing some pollutants. And trees prevent flooding and soil and control soil erosion. So um, their roots are able to hold soil together so it doesn't run off. Um, and since water isn't running off, it's better able to infiltrate the ground and go into groundwater to prevent flooding. So lots of great resources from so here on the top we can see um that we have maple syrup production here uh, we have rubber production here both kind of just involve what's called tapping a tree to get the sap out and then here are some pine nuts this is an example of how lumber might be cut for timber or sorry how a tree might be cut to make lumber and then this is wood pulp when it's pretty much just shredded as it's cut this might be the less desirable trees that couldn't be used for lumber and then this is showing those roots holding back the soil and creating little dams um, to prevent soil erosion um, and here's another look that the surface runoff is stopped by vegetation and then it becomes subsurface flow which is also slowed down by tree roots and tree roots can also prevent bank erosion. So lots of great um, advantages to trees. So managing forests. So nearly one third of the United States is forest. And because new trees can be planted once you chop them down, forests are renewable resources and they will grow in a reasonable amount of time. Most trees can regrow in a human lifetime. Proper logging methods can help maintain forests as renewable resources. So not just going through and necessarily chopping every tree down, doing it well. So a mature forest up here on the top, you could go through and clear cut it, which is where you take out everything. All the trees come down, they get harvested and processed for the wood pulp or lumber, and then you replant it. If you notice, these trees all look the same because in a case of this happening, clear cutting, most likely you're going to want to replant with trees that you'll be able to harvest again soon. And that typically leads to even aged stands of trees that are the same species. Selective cutting is where you don't cut everything down, but you leave some mature trees, some baby trees, a little bit of in between trees. And then you would also replant um, sporadically through there and it creates a more biodiverse forest um, ecosystem. So typically, selective cutting is a better way to go. So sustainable forestry then is um, where you do forestry in a way that makes sure that it will the forest will be there as a resource going forward. So one thing is you manage for a sustainable yield and a sustainable yield is defined as an amount of renewable resource such as a tree that can be harvested regularly without reducing the future supply. Um, the forests in America, most of them that aren't on private land are managed by the U.S. Forest Service, which is in the Department of Agriculture as a federal agency. And that's because we typically manage trees as crops. Um, so after trees are harvested with sustainable forestry, young trees are planted. And in 20 to 30 years, you can have pines tall enough to be harvested for lumber and wood pulp, and hardwoods can take anywhere from 40 to 100 years, depending on the species. 
And with sustainable forestry, you typically only log small patches of forest each year. So you create kind of a mosaic of places that are um, selectively cut in small patches, creating a really diverse uh, forest ecosystem, which can be really healthy for biodiversity. Uh, you can buy certified wood. One way to certify your wood is through the Forest Stewardship Council or the FSC. And you might see this stamped on lumber at a place like Home Depot or Lowe's or anywhere else you might buy wood. Um, it's a global nonprofit organization that um, really wants to make sure that your wood is sustainably sourced or your paper. So the label guarantees that trees are harvested and replaced and can regrow naturally. It respects the indigenous people using the forest. It um, makes sure that people can enjoy the benefits of the forest in the future. It um, tries to improve the forest and you can track where your um, tree came from all the way back to its source and where it was milled at and everything like that. So another resource we might use is fisheries. And an area with a large population of valuable ocean organisms is called a fishery. And for hundreds of years, until the late 1900s, fisheries seemed like an unlimited resource. You just threw your net over the side or went fishing, and there were always fish there to catch. But right now, scientists estimate that over 70% of the world's major fisheries have been overfished, meaning there aren't nearly as many fish in the ocean as there used to be. This, um, this map shows you where people are fishing every year. So this is hours of fishing per square kilometer with dark blue being heavily fished areas and the yellow to light green being less heavily fished areas. So this gives you an idea. You can see it's probably pretty obvious that the coasts are most heavily fished because that's right where people are, but there's also spots in the ocean that are fairly heavily fished as well. So ways that you can improve fisheries, you can ban the fishing of certain species so you prevent species from getting caught um, as best you can. You might limit the number or size of fish that can be caught, um, and you can also set fishing seasons. So things that might reduce how much people are taking out of the oceans. Some other ways that you can help fisheries is using fishing method methods that uh, reduce impacts to young fish or organisms that shouldn't be caught. Certain nets and things that they use to fish with can trap pretty much every living thing that swims through them. So they've increased the size of the holes in the nets to allow smaller fish to swim through to hopefully catch less of those. But other organisms are still caught in those nets. Some fish are being raised through aquaculture. Think of this like raising pigs or chickens or cows. Um, essentially, the fish are now raised, some fish are raised in artificial ponds or bays. Um, it's not a perfect solution as it can cause pollution and spread disease as you feed these fish in these enclosures, especially if they're in the ocean or in a lake. Um, and then uh, more than half of the animal protein eaten by people in the world comes from fish, and that's a lot. So to help prevent overfishing, one thing we can do is um, fish for different species or introduce people with e to easy to farm fishes. So if you've eaten tilapia um, anytime recently, or if you see tilapia in the store, tilapia is being one of those things that's being introduced because it is an easy to farm freshwater fish species. I don't recall eating tilapia when I was growing up, but now I know that it's fairly prevalent in the grocery stores. Water is another important resource that humans use. Uh, this graph is fascinating because it shows total global water with fresh water being only 2.5% of global water. So that's water that we could potentially drink. Of that 2.5%, two thirds of that is trapped in glaciers and ice caps. And another almost third is trapped in groundwater, leaving us just 1.3% of surface water and other fresh water. We can get to groundwater by drilling wells wells tap into groundwater sources, but we can't get to all the groundwater um, and it doesn't refill super fast either. And of the surface water that keep in mind was 1.3% of the 2.5%, 73% is trapped as ice and snow. That's not glaciers and ice caps. 
20% is in lakes, and then the rest is in soil moisture, swamps, marshes, rivers, biological water, and atmospheric water. So we can get to some of the lakes, but keep in mind that's a small percentage of a small percentage of a small percentage. So freshwater is an important resource. Um, there are some people who study civilizations who believe the next major war will be for water. So this is a map of the availability of freshwater. And so um, if you are a darker blue, you have more freshwater available to you. And if you get into the yellow, you're vulnerable. If you're kind of the darker yellow, you're now under stress for water. And if you are the orange color, you have a water scarcity. So you can see that there's a belt through here um, that people are, might be a little more challenged to obtain water. And then this is a water withdrawal percentages map. This means of the total available water for that country, what percentage are they withdrawing? And you can see that that similar area in the middle is heavily withdrawing and they have scarce or stressed water resources. Um, so that could be a thing to consider when looking at countries in the world. Uh, mineral and fossil fuel resources and geology. So there's also mineral resources that humans use. Um, in addition, this will kind of go back into the last lesson with fossil fuels. But um, the resources we use form in very specific environments. So the way rock in an area form determines which mineral resources will be found there. So some fossil and mineral Fossil fuel and mineral resource groups we'll talk about are metals, fossil fuels, other materials like gemstones, salt, gypsum, and phosphates, and then building materials that aren't lumber, so like stone, gravel for roads, or asphalt. And so this is a good table to show you where these things are found. So metals typically are found near volcanic intrusive rocks, means that those rocks were cooled below the Earth's surface, near faults, and in metamorphic rocks. So if we look at gold and silver mining in Utah, it's typically taking place in Little Cottonwood, Big Cottonwood, and Park City because we have volcanic intrusive rocks there. Um, the same with Kennecott Copper Mine across the valley. Salt, calcite, and gypsum, these are sedimentary materials, and these form when elements dissolved in water are left behind by water or when they're deposited when water evaporates. So needs a sedimentary rock um, to form. Uranium, often found in sedimentary rocks. If you go to Southern Utah, you can see where people have uh, prospected for uranium outside of Goblin Valley, outside of Moab, um, and those are all sedimentary rock areas in Utah to find that. Uh, fossil fuels, we talked about this last lesson, they form in sedimentary rocks. Precious gems, can be found in all rock types, but most are igneous and metamorphic. You need the high heat or add some pressure to that to form precious gems. And then building materials. Most rock can be used as building materials. Um, limestone, granite, marble, um, all of those things are popular and they span the gamut of what type of rock they are. So that is your lesson on other resources that humans use from our environment. Thanks for listening and I hope you learned something new.